Romans chapter number one. Thank God for that good singing. It's an exciting time around the Bain household. Uh, yesterday evening, a little grandson swinging on a rope fell off, broke his wrist, and wound up in the emergency room about four o'clock. He'll have to do surgery on him tomorrow. And then got a word from my son David and his wife Lydia uh, has gone into labor. And so they're in the process of having a baby. Amen. And back here sits uh, uh, Donna, my wife, and she's anxious to get out there and be with them and uh, this, that, and the other. So uh, exciting time around the Bain household. But what a blessing it is to be in Tennessee. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate y'all's prayers. Appreciate uh, uh, the friendship of this church and your pastor. And uh, glad he made it home safe and sound off vacation. Amen. All right, let's look in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the mercies of God and your good grace. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in the house of God. Open up the word. And we ask you, Lord, for liberty, power, and strength to be able to preach. And wherever this message goes out, whatever life it touches, I pray our Father would do a mighty and effectual work in the souls of men, and women, boys, and girls. And may there be sinners come to know you as a result of this word that you've laid out before us. Lord, thank you now for this opportunity. We commend it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God inspired the Apostle Paul to write an epistle to the Romans. Rome was the capital of the then known world. They were the major ruling empire. And God was giving an inroad to the gospel even under Rome. Paul said in verse number 16, I'm not ashamed of that gospel of Christ. And he said in verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I want to preach on this thought this morning, unashamed of the gospel. Unashamed of the gospel. Now, there are a lot of people that would have tried to get Paul to be ashamed of the gospel. Just like there are folk in our society today that would try to make us blush or hide this word in a closet somewhere or be ashamed of the message contained therein. Yeah. Same crowds around that was in Paul's day. There is the religious crowd. I'm sure the Jews who hounded Paul, put him in prison, had him beaten, and even persecuted him unto death said to Paul, listen, you were born of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisee. You are a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Your daddy spent a lot of money educating you under the feet of the renowned Gamaliel, the doctor of the law. You graduated as top in your class in Judaism. You had zeal to persecute this way. You called them blasphemers. You injured them. You imprisoned them and even put them to death and determined you would exterminate them. But now here you are preaching that same message that you said you would wipe off the face of the earth. You ought to be ashamed, Paul. You're disgracing Judaism. You're disgracing your forefathers. You have shamed us and uh, we're all embarrassed by you and you ought to be embarrassed, Paul. Paul said, no, I can't be embarrassed by this glorious gospel. Amen. For I was a blind lost man, had scales on my eyes, but I could never forget the day when Jesus came and the scales dropped and I understood who Jesus Christ really was. And you know, we've got religions all around us that would shame us out of the gospel message. They say we're bigots. They say we're narrow-minded. They say that we need to calm and quell the message down and not uh, be so uh, sharp or so pointed in the truth that's being preached. You need to be more tolerant. Uh, you need to cool off a little bit. They say, are you not ashamed of 
uh, standing and publicly proclaiming that people that don't get saved are going to hell and just you believers are going to hell. You ought to be ashamed of all that. Uh, you ought to be ashamed of the message of the cross and all of those things. But I say to the religious crowd, I'm not ashamed Amen. of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Paul had rulers in his day that would try to shame him out of the gospel. The Romans claimed that their emperor, their leader, their czar king was Lord, that he was God and that he was to be bowed to. When I was preaching in Turkey back just a while ago, I went to the ruins of the church at Ephesus, got to go to all seven of the church ruins along with Hierapolis and Colossae. And as I was coming down through the Ephesian ancient village, I uh, came to the uh, right side. There's the bathhouses and a lot of public buildings there. And there was a large beam. And on that beam was an enormous round rock. On top of that round rock was a foot. And none, nothing of the rest of the statue was there. And I'm standing there looking at this. And about that time, there's a guide that brought their group and stopped in front of this. And the guide said, let me point something out. And they said, you see that round ball? That is a globe. The Romans knew that the earth was round way back then. Yeah. On top of that ball, there's a foot. That foot belonged to Hadrian, the emperor of Rome. And underneath, on this beam, it says, Hadrian, Lord over all the earth. And he felt himself to be Lord over all the earth. And he expected everybody to bow down to him. But the truth is, his statue's gone. Uh, stone foot's there. Uh, he's burning in hell if he didn't get saved. But if you study the book of Ephesians in chapter number 1, there is the declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord over all the earth. And that wasn't an accidental statement. God was answering what Hadrian had put right there in that Ephesus community. And it was the book written back to the Ephesian believers saying, hey, he's not Lord, I am Lord. And yet the Roman government would have tried to cause Paul to blush. They put him in jail and out of jail. They beat him, tried to whip it out of him and all of that. We've got a government today in office that would try to shame us. Our president said that America never was a Christian nation, and if it ever was, it's not one now. And he's got many Muslims in his cabinet, and uh, he's favored them. He and Hillary Clinton put the Muslim Brotherhood into Egypt, which was nothing more than uh, trying to overtake and turn it to Sharia law. They killed uh, hundreds and hundreds of our believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, I know men, I preached for them that had their church buildings demolished and all that, but God in mercy caused it to all be overturned. And when they overthrew the government by the coup and they began to set up a more tolerant of Christianity government, our president said, I'll withdraw the billion dollars that uh, we're giving unto them like he has the power of purse, but Congress has let him buy with all this. And I don't understand all these things. I really don't. But I was witnessing the other day to a Jewish man and invited him to a Baptist church where I was preaching at. And he said, uh, I'm Jewish. I said, I love Jewish people. He said, uh, but how can that be? I said, you know, I appreciate what your president did for our nation the other day. He said, you talking about Benjamin Netanyahu? I said, sure. He came over and addressed our nation in Congress. And at the end of his speech, he said, I am glad to have my friend Moses with me here today. And all the cameras of the world turned to the back of the building that he was facing to this enormous mural of Moses the prophet. And he said he's here on the wall. And in one moment of time, that Jewish man said to America, hey, this Washington, D.C. is marked with the testimony of a Judeo-Christian heritage, and you're not going to erase it by one president that comes by to try to blush us 
shame us and sanitize this country of any national testimony of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to let this bunch who says no prayer in school and tries to forbid our children of worship there. You've got a right to take your Bible to school and put it right on top of all the textbooks if you want to. The children in America still got a right to bow their head and pray God bless this food and you can do what you want to do and they have no right to stop or hinder you though you'll have teachers and principals in schools that'll try to shame you and other students that'll try to shame you out of this gospel. We have workplaces and people that think it's against the law for folk to publicly witness in this hour because of the governmental uh, uh, animosity toward the gospel that you and I have. But I'm not going to let the rulers, as Paul didn't let the rulers, stop or hinder him. Then there were riotous folk that tried to stop him. There were barbarians. He dealt with men, the Bible says, of the baser sort. And they didn't like that message of repentance. And, and it's wrong for them to commit adultery, to take dope, and uh, to have all of these different things of uh, uh, sorcery. And you remember when the devils were cast out of the young lady there in Philippi, that riotous crowd, they uh, brought a warrant against him, had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into jail. But Paul said, I'm not going to let this riot, this drunken, blaspheming, cursing, adulterating crowd blush my face and red my face concerning the gospel. I'll stay with it. Amen. Amen. There's some of you sitting right here. When you go home today, you'll go home to a drunken husband or you'll go home to a bickering wife. Or you go home to children that laugh at you and scorn you for that old time religion. Amen. And I listen to testimonies all across this country. And I know there's a lot of God's people that when they leave these walls of the building, they go right back into the den of lions. They're cursed. They're maligned. Yeah. They're accused of running around. They're accused of this, that, and the other. But praise God, don't you let them shame you out of the gospel. You just hold your head high and march on for the glory of God. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Now let's look at this text and see some things he's not ashamed of. Number one, look in verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He said, I am unashamed of the debt and the responsibility of the gospel. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm debtor both to the wise, uh, to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. Now, this morning, if we started on this side and went through this congregation and said, all right, stand up and tell me uh, how far in debt you are. Do you open your house? Do you open your car? Are you still paying on your school loans? How much debt do you have? You look at me and say, preacher, that's none of your business. That's between me and the bank and the good Lord. And, and I recognize that. I know that. But Paul said, I'm in debt, head over heels. And I'm not ashamed of the debt and the responsibility that the gospel brings with it. Right. Now, if you're saved by the grace of God, when you got saved, you got out of debt. Your sins are paid for. Right. Yeah. But you also got into debt. And that debt is to tell others how you got out of debt. Right. Amen. Amen. Yep. I read over in the book of uh, 2 Kings, chapter number 7, about four lepers sitting outside the gate of the city. The city has been besieged by the Syrians. They're starving to death. It's gotten to the place where there's even cannibalism. They're eating children and boiling them. It's awful. It's terrible. And these four lepers are sitting outside the gate, and they look at each other, and there's one thinking man among them. He looks at his buddies and says, Why sit we here till we die? Amen. You know, they're not going to feed us inside. And if we go to the Syrian camp, all they're going to do is kill us and we're going to die anyhow. So what have we got to lose? And so they said, well, sounds like a plan to me. And they begin to walk toward the Syrian camp. They went over the horizon just out of the line of sight. They're moving into the realm of faith. And when they got there, they looked around and every Syrian was gone. 
Man, they seen a fire in a pot over there, and I can see some hot stew. Right. And one of them says, I'm going to get some of this before they come back. And they begin to eat. They start eating bread. They start filling up, running from tent to tent. These old boys have been on starvation, and now they're eating, and they're filling up, getting fuller and fuller. One of them sees a nice garment laying there, and he said, man, I've always wanted this. An old leopard owns that garment. Another fellow said, look at that pair of shoes left behind. He put shoes on, and another one comes out with a nice hat, and another one's got a sword on his side, and these boys are eating till their heart's content. Amen. They're sitting around now, and they've eaten all they can eat. You want some more bread, man? No, I don't believe I can eat it. I found a cake of figs. You want some? No, I can't handle any more. And they're belching and a burping and a bragging on how rich they are. Woo! Oh, God's been good. Hallelujah. Look how we're blessed. Do you see my new garment? Yeah, oh, that's fine garment. How you like my hat? I like that hat. And it sounds like an average American camp meeting. <laughs> Look how God has blessed us. Oh, praise God. The Lord's so good. He sure is, man. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Look how rich I am. And they're sitting around and they're just enjoying the good blessings. And then it calms down. And I reckon it was that thinking leper got to thinking again. And he said, we're not going to do well if we tarry till the morning. And I'd like to heard all of that conversation. The Bible don't record it all. But I figure one of them said, yeah, but you know, them rascals, they wouldn't even, they, they locked us outside the gate. They wouldn't feed us. They didn't care whether we lived or died. Yeah, but that's not the point. We've stuck it rich. God's blessed us. He's run these Syrians off however he did it. We don't know. And they're dying in starvation. And if we sit here and glut, there's more food than we'll ever be able to eat. There's more garments than we'll ever be able to wear. There's more gold and resources than we can ever spend, boys. And if we sit here and don't go back to camp and tell them, Something bad's going to happen to us. God's going to judge us. Amen. They said, all right. And sure enough, they went back to the gate in the midnight hour. Somebody ran, woke the king up. The porter said, hey, they said the Syrians are gone. These fat lepers are standing out here. And, man, they're clothed in nice guard. And said, they're all gone. And, uh, and the king said, oh, it's a trap. It's a trap. They pulled back to lure us out so they could take the city. And the porter said, listen. It may be, but why don't you take the last of the five horses that we've got and send riders and chariots and go out and see if that's what's happened. Let them follow the trail of the Syrians. They, they said they hightailed it out of town and stroke garments and stuff all along the way. Why don't you go see? Just go see. And so he sent those men out. They went on the trail. They found it exactly like the leper said. They went down the trail. They found garments strolled. These fellas got rabbit in their feet. God is in a noise and a rumor and rattling their sabers and horse hooves and scared the daylights out of the Syrians. And they fled all the way back to the house. These men come back. You see a dust cloud rise, and they're getting closer to the city. They slide sideways and say, it's just like they said. Boy, all of a sudden, one slips out the gate and heads that way, and then another one. And as they start receiving and getting the riches, they come back over the horizon, which is in the world of faith, and they come to the world of sight, and they say, look what God's done for us. And what God's done for us, he can do for you. And there was a stampede that took place, and the porter was stomped to death, just like God's prophet had told him. By that evening, the Lord would bless and give the abundance that they needed. And lo and behold, the whole village was spared because one leper said, I'm a debtor yeah. to all men, yeah. to the barbarians, Amen. to the wise, to the unwise, to the king, to the pauper. I've got to go tell. We sit here on these pews. How many safe folk have we got? Would you raise your hand if you're saying, would you wave at me real big? Praise God. I'll tell you, we could stir the air conditioner up with all that waving going on this morning. 
I bless the Lord for that, but you know every one of us are in debt, head over heels. I hear people dying. Heard somebody died the other day, and uh, I asked the fellow, I said, you know them? Uh, yeah, yeah. I said, they got killed suddenly. I said, well, were they saved? They said, well, uh, I don't know. I said, how long did you work with them? Oh, better than 10 years. And yet they'd never ask them about their soul's condition. Never. Do you know if your boss man's saved? Do you know if your co-worker's saved? Have you asked the testimony of your neighbor? I'm not going to work with a man 10 minutes, much less 10 years, and not start inquiring or trying to find a door to be a witness to that person. Amen. And how can we sit around eating the bread of life, drinking the water of life, partaking of the sweet vine and of the pomegranates and the glories of the Lord donning the robes of righteousness and being found so rich in Christ, we can never spend it all. We can never dig to the depth of the riches of Christ without telling somebody else Amen. what Jesus had done for us Amen. and how he brought us out of spiritual death. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the debt and the responsibility the gospel brings. Number two, look in verse 15. I'm not ashamed of the depth and the readiness the gospel requires. He said, so, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul had preached on the, uh, at, at Mars Hill. He had preached in the port villages. He had preached in the outstations. He had preached in the country. He had preached in Jerusalem. He had preached all over. And now he said, I'm ready to go to you that are at Rome also as much as in me is. And nobody was paying him to go. Nobody was even inviting him to come. But he had something down deep in his soul that pressed him on to take the gospel even unto Rome. It's what the Bible calls in me is. As much as in me is, I'm ready. You know, the apostle said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I don't understand men that say they're called to preach and they never preach and they don't want to preach. When God saved me and called me to preach, man, I wanted to preach. I remember being in Bible college. They had these worksheets you had to fill out so they'd make sure you're doing a little something while you're in Bible college. And I had to use the front and the back. You usually ran out of room uh, for the month's testimony of what you were trying to do. We had five rest homes, had a jail ministry, a prison ministry, had a street ministry, had two uh, Saturday night youth meetings, prayer meetings, and just on and on it went. There was something in me that said, hey, you've got to go. You've got to go. You don't have to come back, but you've got to go. A drive and a force. I remember the old timers around home, young men say, oh, God's called me to preach. They say, oh, I'll just go on back to work. Forget about it. You know, don't let it bother you. You come back in another week or so and say, man, I really believe God's called me to preach. Oh, you, you'll get over it, son. Just don't worry about it. And it won't be long until he's, oh, God called me back. He did me. All right, son. Amen. It's a driving call, not mama call, not daddy sent, not a vocation, Amen. not looking for a fat paycheck, an easy job, yeah. but a drive in the soul. You can't pay a man of God what he's worth. You can't pay a pastor for all the burdens and heartaches that he carries. You can't pay a missionary to root his family up and go around the world and, and be in the, the heat of the battle and do what he does. There ain't enough money on the face of the earth. But thank God there is a call. And the Bible says if any man desire the office of a bishop, and that word desire means to stretch out as far as you can stretch. And it's a driving thing. And when that was written, they were dressing men up in wax garments, setting them on fire to light up the wicked parties of Rome because they'd simply preached the gospel. Yeah. They were crucifying them, throwing them to the gladiators and to the lion's den. And yet the Lord gives an epistle and looks out over that congregation, says, any of you desire the office of a bishop? 
any sane person would say, man, you crazy. You think I'm going to volunteer for something like that? You are nutsy. And yet they stood up by the multitude and a great number of disciples. They surrendered to the word of God because as much as in me is a driving factor that goes beyond pay, that goes beyond popularity, that goes beyond a success, that goes beyond uh, whether the world likes it or not, it's a driving force to take that word. And when we have revival, God's church gets filled with this in the ears. It's a swelling of the soul that can't be hampered, dampered, or stopped. Amen. Number three, look in verse 16. The apostle says, I'm not ashamed of the dynamics and the reign of the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said this gospel is powerful. It is dynamic. It's a reigning gospel. This is not some weak, wishy-washy message that somebody hatched out of a cave somewhere. He said this is the gospel of Christ. He said I'm not ashamed of the title of it. The gospel of Christ, the anointed Messiah. And you know, the blessed part about this Bible is, it is the textbook and the history book from the beginning of Adam and Eve all the way down. And it's the record of people that were there to see what God did and how he fulfilled his word and performed it in bringing the Christ, the Messiah, to us. I was street preaching down at the fountain in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Ran into a lady first thing, and, and she said, Oh, you're a Bible thumper, are you? And I said, No, I'm a gospel preacher. She said, Well, I believe in the million, billion year theory. I said, Ma'am, were there any scientists around when all that was supposed to happen? Yeah. She said, uh, No. said, It's a theory. I said, Well, you know, in my hand, I've got this Bible. And if you ever take a notion to read it, it'd be real interesting reading till you get to Chronicles, and then there's going to be a long list of names that only a Hebrew scholar can pronounce. And you'll finally wade through those, and then you get on through the rest of the Scripture till you come to Matthew, and then you get another list of names, and then you come to Luke, and you get another list of names. I said, do you know what that's all about? She said, what? I said, that is the listing of the forefathers in the previous generation that were eyewitnesses as to what God did. There was somebody around that saw it happen. It is a written historical record that all the works of Almighty God. I'm not preaching to you Batman or Superman. This is not Greek mythological tale. He is called the Christ. And from the garden where he said he would be born of the seed of the woman, the virgin born son of God, all the way down, the place he would be born, the time he would be born, what would happen in the heavens, who would come and visit him, where he would go as a child, what city he would be raised in, what his name would be called, what lineage he would be born of, what the government would do in that hour, what he would perform upon this earth, all the things he would do, every one of them was saluted and said, fulfill, 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 in one person. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul made a whole lot of this. He said, this is publicly read and written and it's in your synagogues. You read it. You proclaimed it for hundreds of years before he ever came. And this one five minutes after Jesus was born or after he died, we're talking hundreds of years of biblical record. And now this is the very Christ, and I preach him unto you. Amen. Paul said, you think I'm going to be ashamed of that? No, sir, it'll stand up to scrutiny. Amen. But then not only the title of this gospel, but the transformation. He said, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. You remember who God inspired to write this now? This is not a fellow raised in a Baptist Sunday school class. This is a Jew that's got both fists balled up against the Son of God and determined to exterminate. He's the head of the ISIS of the day. He's the one that wanted to wipe Christianity off the map. And he said, no 
way, no way. But the Lord let him get around God's people. And when God did deal with him there on the road to Damascus, he said, you've been kicking against the pricks. The pricks where the ox goes. When he looked at Stephen as he had him stoned, and Stephen gave the answer to the Sanhedrin court, they could not argue against the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He quoted some 37 different verses of Scripture out of 17 books of the Old Testament. He almost had them on their seat, giving them a Jewish history lesson of what God had done. And then he made the application that was all fulfilled in Jesus. And that's when they couldn't, they couldn't stand it anymore. And so they ran on him and gnashed on him with their teeth. You know, when I used to get in fights as a little boy, if he's getting the best of somebody, they'd revert to biting you. <laughs> Reminded me of Andrew Holyfield, Mike Tyson. You know, Holyfield had beaten the daylights out of old Tyson. He wasn't used to that. About three seconds, he'd done knocked a fella in the corner and collected his millions of dollars. Well, old Vander Holyfield beating the daylights out of it. And so he reverted to biting a chunk out of his ear. And they interviewed Tyson afterwards and said, why did you do that? He said, that man is killing me. He's killing me. I had to protect myself. Well, old Stephen is killing them. They couldn't handle it. And then when they did stone him, it was like he just fell asleep. And before God called him out, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And I can see Saul look at him and say, he looked like he was looking at somebody. Who was he looking at? I see Je I don't see Jesus anywhere. Now, if he was a blasphemer, how did he fall asleep like that? Ah, I, I, forget it, forget it, forget it. But he couldn't forget it. Gouge. And he'd drag women by the hair of the head, and he'd compel men, blaspheme him, blaspheme him. I cannot deny my Lord and my Savior. He's been so good. Do what you will, but he's so good to me. I cannot but tell you the things that I've seen and I've heard. Ah, then he just kicked against it and went on down the road. And as he's going down the road to Damascus, he had his sight set on uh, those believers down there, Ananias and all that group. But the Bible said there shined a light round about him. It wasn't sunlight. It wasn't artificial light. This was God's light. The God who commanded the light to shine out of our darkness, he said in Corinthians, has shined the light of the glorious gospel into our heart. God turned the light on. He fell on his face. And he inquired, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus. He had read about an I am back yonder in Moses' experience of the burning bush, and he'd got a glimpse of that same fire. Hallelujah. The I am that I am had come on the scene. And old Saul said, Lord, Lord, he called on the name of the Lord. What will thou have me to do? God washed away his sin, totally changed his life. And when he finally got on his feet and got his sight back, he went to the synagogue in Damascus. And they said, boy, we're glad you're here. We know you're running a little late, but uh, here, here, you, you, take, you take the scroll and you read. He started reading. And boy, as he began to talk about a prophet like unto Moses, and he started reading Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and all of that. And he said, I'm here to declare to you this day that who he's talking about is none other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth that was crucified in Jerusalem, that rose from the dead. And I met him out here on the road just a few days ago, and now he lives in my heart. And that bunch looked at him with big eyes and gaping mouth and said, Is this not he that came to destroy this name? And now he's preaching this name. And they were all amazed. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Paul said, You think I'm going to be ashamed of this gospel? It's the power of God unto salvation. You know, if we'll just preach the gospel, God will save, and we'll see the mighty power wrought therein. Preaching in India some time ago when we were riding back from a village, and one of those preachers said, Brother Andy, said, the most of the people we see saved in our ministries are saved either when you're here or during Easter time. I said, you want me to tell you why? 
He said, why? I said, when I come over here, I have one message, and that is to preach the gospel. During Easter time, you are forced to preach the gospel because you're going to talk about the seven cries of the cross, the resurrection, and all of that. And because of that, God honors the gospel, and he saves souls. It's the power of God. Boy, it's been a blessing to watch it work in all kind of lives. I was in Matwapa, Africa, preaching on the street with Brother Joseph Kangu, my translator, and preaching there, and folk were just walking by. I watched out the corner of my eye, and this Maasai guy come walking up through there, and he stopped, and he backed up to a pole, and he put his foot up like this, and he held his uh, spear up like that. And he just kept listening and kept listening and kept listening and finished uh, the message up and gave a cry if anybody uh, wanted to get saved or right with God. And here come that Masa over there. He and Brother Joseph talked a long time. He got down on his knees in the middle of that street and got saved by the grace of God. I got to watch the gospel stop him dead in his tracks. And you know, he's a deacon in the Baptist church there now. Hallelujah. I was preaching in Kalifi, Africa, and we were at this preaching point, and it overlooked this little old dumpy village, and I'll never forget preaching, and we were preaching down into the village, and I watched a lady come out of her house and sit on her porch. She sat there, and she listened and listened, and a little bit she moved from her porch to the edge of her yard. She moved from the edge of her yard down to the little old creek. I seen her cross that creek and start up the trail where we were at. She just kept getting closer and closer and closer. And at the end of it, she got saved. I watched the gospel literally draw her out of her house, bring her up that trail to a place of faith and repentance and see her get saved by the grace of God. You think I'm going to be ashamed of this gospel that's still the power of God unto salvation? How many testimonies could we have sitting right here? Some of you used to uh, be drunk. Some of you used to uh, have dope in your veins. Some of you used to be sleeping out on the streets. Some of you just didn't care. I had a testimony about beer in the refrigerator and all of that when God came by, pouring it all down the door. Who else could do that? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious gospel of the Son of God bring a person out of self-righteousness out of religion to the reality of the redeeming grace of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the dynamics and the glorious power and reign of this gospel. Then I want you to look at this. He said, I'm not ashamed of the diversity that it reaches in verse 16. He said, to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I like what Brother Joseph said one time there in Africa. He's Gary Armand. There's many different tribes, and whenever they have a political election, normally they ride in the street and they kill each other, and all of this was going on. Brother Joseph's a Gary Armand, that coastal region, and he's got Maasai's and Luo's and all kind of other tribal people in his church. And when they'd come through rioting and raiding and killing each other, he would harbor and hide them. Somebody found out about it and said, Pastor Joseph, you're Gary Arm. They're this, they're that. Said, why do you, why do you hide them? He said, Listen, I am of the tribe of Jesus. Amen. 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 Paul said, This gospel reaches to everyone that believeth. Red, yellow, black, or white, they are precious in his sight. From one end of this old globe to the other, thank God God will save an Eskimo. He'll save a New York banker. Amen. He'll save a gangster over in Chicago. Lord will save a hillbilly out of Tennessee and western North Carolina. Glory to God. He'll save moral folk. He'll save drunken folk that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have permission, yea, commission, to carry this gospel to every creature on the face of this planet and display the glorious salvation of Jesus and then watch God say, how can you be ashamed of such a glorious gospel that reaches such a diversity of people? Then I want to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in verse 17 because of the details of righteousness. 
For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Right. If you're ever going to be righteous, the only way is by the gospel. Right. Trust in him who died for our sins, Amen. who was buried, and who rose again. Right. No other way will God impute to you his righteousness right. or will he wash away one of your sins right. lest you trust him. Then I want to say I'm not ashamed of the damnation and the retribution attached to this gospel. Right. Look in verse 18. For the wrath of God's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Right. A lot of folk have tried to divorce judgment from the gospel. They'll quote John 3.16, right. but they forget the word perish right. is in John 3.16. Right. And the fact is, friend, that if you don't get saved, this gospel is a savor of life unto life, but it's a savor of death unto death. Right. And the wrath of God will be revealed against you if you try to bypass this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You don't hear a whole lot of preaching on hell, the lake of fire, the brimstone, eternal retribution and judgment from God. All you hear today is God is love. He sure is. And if he wasn't a God of love, there wouldn't be none of us existing, much less saved by the grace of God. But he's also a God of wrath. And there is but one way in all history, in all eternity, that has been provided that a holy God can forgive an unholy sinner and that is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be washed in his blood. Amen. And if that is bypassed, if that's refused, if that's rejected, then God said you will die in your sins, plural. Yeah. He said the fearful, the unbelieving, the whoremonger, all of those will have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone. And Jesus said, the worm died not, and the fire is not quenched. In Luke 16, there's a rich man in hell right now crying for one drop of water that will never be given to him. And it will never be given to you. You die lost without God. And some of you have been thinking, hey, I'm not that stupid to go to hell. I can see him or her going, but not me. You keep putting it off, and it's like playing Russian roulette with your soul one day. You're going to meet God. One of these days on that calendar has got your time up here, your opportunities at hand. God said, I stretched my hand out all the day long. And if I'm reaching out to you, that means I want to shake hands with you. And the Lord's calling you, dealing with you. But one day you'll wind up in hell. You spurn the gospel of the Son of the living God. But then lastly, I want to say I'm not ashamed of the deliverance and the redemption the gospel brings. He said it's the power of God under salvation. I don't have to go to hell. Amen. Lord of God, because of the gospel, I have everlasting life. Not just the quality of it, but the quantity of it. And I'll live as long as God lives and abide with him in glory. Friend, when I'm walking down the street of gold in a glorified body and I'm magnifying my Savior, and somebody says, you're proud to be here, and I'll say, I'm humble to be here. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb, yes, for His blood was shed to redeem us, and if it wasn't for Him, I sure wouldn't be here. Amen. And I'm not ashamed of the home God's got prepared and the hope of heaven that He's given His children. Amen. The message is unashamed of the gospel. Amen. Are you ashamed of it today? Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Have you repented of your sins and called on his name? And then if we are saved, maybe those lepers were a rebuke to us today to say, look how rich we've struck it. Look how good God's been. Amen. Now can I sit here and just glut on that? Or do I need to go out of these walls and go to the house? And wherever I'm at, and try to share this word and tell folk, hey, I've got a better debt free plan than Dave Ramsey. Amen. 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 That's right. And we got a glorious word 
that we can give them. Right. Let's not hide it. I want you to stand all over the house this morning. Brother, would you get us a song? If you're here today not saved, God spoke to your heart, would you come and call on him? Or maybe as a child of God, God spoke to you about being more bold concerning the gospel and taking a stronger stand. Maybe God's laid somebody on your heart that you work with. You've never even approached them one time. Maybe a family member, maybe a neighbor. And God spoke to you about that. Maybe you want to just come call their name. We're singing what number? Page 383 in your all America. Let's sing it out now. God spoke to you. You want to join these praying? You come on right now as we wait before him. I hear the Savior say, my strength. something as you go out the door today will you drop by that track rack and pick up a couple of three or four or five gospel tracks and determine by the time this Sunday and next Sunday comes you're going to give them out if everybody would do that they'd take just five tracks we'd reach probably at least 500 to 1,000 folk between now and next Sunday by just, just doing that, just that, that little bit. It wouldn't press anybody. It wouldn't put anybody out. And you'll cross paths with people. Your preacher, this evangelist, will never meet in this life. But God will gift your path, like Philip and the Ethiopian, to cross paths with him. And you'll have an opportunity. If you'll pray, God, help me to go back to the camp, to the village. Tell them how I got out of debt and how I struck it rich. Would you do that? Let's bow our heads and hearts. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll burden every heart here. Lord, include my own. Be more conscious of how rich you've made us and what a gospel we have. And help us not to be ashamed of it in any way, but help us to carry it out to this lost and dying world. In Jesus' name. Let's sing that last.